Hey everybody, this is Perch and I'm here with Joe and we have the, the great pleasure of talking to Rachel Pollock today. Um, and uh, this is something we've been looking for for a long time. So thank you very much for joining us. Oh, my pleasure. I've been looking forward to it too. So great. Really glad. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So for, for people who, um, who are kind of new to Rachel's work, I think uh, she had a, I, the, the part where a lot of people in comics, I think really zero in. And that's, that's part, at least part of what we wanted to talk to you about is uh, you, you took over for, in, uh, for Doom Patrol, uh, for Vertigo uh, back in the, uh, the early nineties. Uh, I think Graham Morrison had been working on the title. You come on board, you do a really excellent uh, run of about two years. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. Uh, and then there's a lot of other comic work and fiction work. And we want to talk to you all about all that, but sure. uh, yeah. Yeah. You, you know, um, one of the first things though, um, want to dive into uh you you were a, a fan of comics growing up absolutely yeah i'm i'm old enough to have been lucky enough that really when i was just starting to read and start to read comics um the original captain marvel was still available for a year or two mm-hmm. yeah and i just totally fell in love with that with captain marvel jr the marvel family i, you know, I had no idea why i stopped publication and, you know when yeah. you're a kid you have no idea of lawsuits and things like that mm-hmm. and and but here's a here's a fun thing that I love to, to tell. So when I was a kid, you know, you don't you don't somehow don't realize that people make comics. Yeah, because yeah. kids are just there. Yes. And so um, you have no idea that there's different artists. So I would read um, Captain Marvel and the Marvel Family, which looked very similar, and then Captain Marvel Jr. would have his own. I don't know if he had his own book. I mean, just like a would have a story in another book, you know. Sure. And he looked totally different. And I found this very confusing. <laughs> yeah, I couldn't figure out why she looked different. You know, it's like I love that. And then he was a different artist. But something else about that that is really is fascinating. I read something a few years ago that the, the way the artist drew his hairstyle was modeled on no, yep, yeah, Elvis Presley models his hairstyle on Captain Marvel Jr. <laughs> That's all great. It was like you know. Pop- <laughs> Haircut, brush back, and slick. Yeah. You more than a Captain Marvel Jr. Isn't that great? Oh, I love that. Yeah. I, I love that. I, I, people forget about that. When they're, like when they first come into comics and you're a kid and you, you don't, of course, you don't know the business. We're all too over, well, I don't know if this is the right statement. We're all too over educated now. We think too much about the details. We miss the charming mm-hmm. part of why does this why does the character look different? It's a different comic. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And um, you, you're also a, a fan of Jack Kirby, right? Yes. I, I, was if I didn't know Jack Kirby's earlier work that much, um, mm-hmm. I first became associated through Fantastic Four, yeah. Yeah. and I love what they were doing. And I didn't know about all this controversy, you know, who mm-hmm. created those comics and who was the real inspiration and so on. And then when he moved to DC, and he was clearly bitter about stuff. Yes. And he did these savage satires on uh, Stan Lee. Yes. And um, who was the guy who worked, the younger writer, who wrote all the comics for Stanley? He, he was like wrote, wrote everything anyway. Can remember. Roy Thomas maybe. Yeah, Roy Thomas. That's yeah, Roy Thomas. Yeah. And um, and Kirby did this savage um, satire in I think there yes. were people about it. Yeah, anyway, Cur- Kirby so, had opinions on Roy Thomas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. But, but the thing was that was interesting to me. Well, because the reason I credited Kirby's accounts of things and people who supported him, because. In the Forever People and the New Gods books, you could see all the ideas that had been in Fantastic Four. Yeah. Particularly Galactus was, you know, was obviously Kirby. Uh, Ian Newman, so much of that made Fantastic Four so big and incredible was Kirby, obviously. Yeah. And so I just, and I totally fell in love with that. And I, and I fell in love with the fact that Kirby wrote from deep inside himself. Yes. You know? he, he wasn't calculating what's going to sell. Yeah. And you can see this in the New God's works because those were so um, raw in a certain sense. Yeah. And the, my favorite in a certain sense was in, um, I forget which, uh, I guess it's um, Mr. Miracle, that's right. Mm-hmm. And there's a storyline in which Mr. Miracle, for some reason, goes to the corporate headquarters of some company. And he's way up in like the 50th floor or something like this. Yes. And he gets challenged. And the challenge is to be able to leave the building because he's an escape artist, right? Yeah. And she thinks this is what a bizarre challenge, you know? And then what happens is that the um, enemy, the villain, pumps paranoid, paranoia gas into the air system. Yes. And so everyone goes berserk. And so it's a real challenge, Mr. Miracle, not to hurt anyone because they're all innocent victims, but not be 
pulled apart by these crazy mobs. And I had just been starting working for DC, I think. I think I already was working for DC at that point. Mm-hmm. And I remember their corporate offices were in this beautiful building in Manhattan. Mm-hmm. Pretty high up. They'd moved from a small one to this <laughs> big building. And okay, this is where he got that story. He went to see when he went for DC, he went to their offices and he had this paranoid flash. Yeah. Suppose <laughs> there suppose there was some gas in this air conditioning system. And mm-hmm. the entire building was filled with people being paranoid, crazy, and, and violent. <laughs> you could just you could see where the yeah. stuff came from. Yeah. He, he had yeah. this wonderful story for every people where the forever people get captured. Um, by, I guess, it's the sod. He's yeah. going to torture them, right? And he takes them to a place called Happy Land. Oh, yes, I know this. And Happy yeah. Land is Disney World. Yes. Or Disneyland in California. Because Kirby lived in California at that point. Mm. And, and so you just got that Kirby had gone to Disneyland. And he thought, what if this place really was a prison? Yes. You know, yeah. some sort of dark, villainous, terrifying prison. And people who were in prison didn't know why no one else, everyone was just laughing and happy looking. I see reality. So that's the kind of thing that just that I found so inspirational. Mm-hmm. That he could write comics from so deep inside himself, yeah. and and not just figure out what's currently fashionable or what the market wants and things like that. And so that's kind of what I was hoping to do with Doom Patrol and some of the other stuff I did too. And you wanted to write for Marvel back in the seventies, didn't you? Oh, that's a funny story. Yeah, so. <laughs> I had been working for IBM. Hey, mm-hmm. it, you know, first I dropped out of graduate school. I was a really cl- great dropout. Very bad at dropping out. I didn't drop out until I had a master's degree. <laughs> but, okay, enough is enough, you know? And I wanted to write. And I went back to my parents' house, and I said I would like, drive a taxi so I could, at night so I could write in the day. And it, no, 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 no. <laughs> dropping out of graduate school and do something. Different. So they taught me to get a job at IBM, which I hated. So yeah. after a year or so, I thought, I got to get out of here. You know, less than a year. I just got to get out of this place. And so, um, so I applied to write for Marvel. And I really had no idea how the process went. You know, and I had an idea for a character who was based on dreams. And I sort of wrote this sample script for this character. I had no idea you were supposed to use their characters. Mm. I was very naive. I didn't, I didn't look up anything to find out what you do when you apply to write for a company. <laughs> <Anyway. laughs> <laughs> there was no internet back then, so at least I could say that for myself. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, um, but you know, so they told me that they weren't hiring anybody. Okay, so then I got it. So the next step was I contacted a well, professor of mine and said, Can you help me? And with his recommendation help, I got a job teaching freshman English, you know, that, those kind of jobs, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so there I am teaching at this college. And one night I decided to give a lecture to whoever wanted to come, whatever students wanted to come. And I forget what the lecture was about, something, you know, symbolic and storytelling, mm-hmm. usual kind of stuff. Right. And then um, somebody said to me in the question time, said, how did you come to teach here? I mean, they figured out it wasn't the usual sort of teacher. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. And I said, well, I said, I couldn't get a job writing for Marvel Comics. And the place just was uproar. <laughs> <laughs> at, that moment, at that moment, I think I became a legend. You know? yes. <laughs> the college teacher who took the job teaching college because she couldn't get a job writing for Marvel Comics. You know? That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> so that was, a, that was a fun thing. I would have loved to. When yeah. you... Before I, I love, I always love the story of your introduction into Doom Patrol because they <laughs> you're writing the you're, they, they were they're printing letters of you oh, basically as a fan saying please let me write Doom Patrol. That was a fake. Yeah, no, no, it, it, no, one, it, no one realized it. Yes, <laughs> that's the funny so, part. It, what it, happened it, was so I knew Neil Gaiman because we were both yeah. in the English science fiction writing scene, and he was just starting to get involved with comics. In fact, I first I had not known what was happening in comics, and and Neil brought these uh, black and whites to show from a work in progress that he just found so incredibly exciting, and it was Alan Moore, and I, I think it might have been Watchmen actually. Um, yeah. So I was obviously you know, knocked out by this and talking to Neil. And so I just became interested in the idea of what you could do in comics these days. And I had some thoughts of a graphic novel I wanted to write. And I went to this party, and Neil was there. And Neil introduced me to Stuart Moore, who was an editor at yeah. Vertigo, really, really wonderful guy. And I mentioned to him my love of Doom Patrol. 
and Grant Morrison's work and how long, and great it was. And he said, oh, well, the editor, Tom Parr, is right over there. Why don't you go talk to him? So I go, great. Mm -hmm. I was talking to Tom and talking to how great Doom Patrol is, you know, and what Grant Morrison was doing, which is so phenomenal. Mm -hmm. and anyway, and so I said to him, you know, Doom Patrol, I'm not really looking to write Mansion Con, but Doom Patrol is the only one I would really fantasize around writing sometime, if it ever was possible. And Tom said, well, actually, Grant's going to be leaving soon. Would you like to send me a sample script? And I'll see if maybe it would be suitable. So I did that, right? right. And he said, this is great. We'll use the extra first issue. And, you know, it was, it was several months away, right? So I'm starting to work on it. So meanwhile, at back then, they had the letter columns in the back of the comic, they were prints before the computer. And so I wrote a column. I wrote a letter. Didn't tell him I was doing it. You know, I had to hope that he would, that he would see it, you know? <laughs> anyway, so the letter was like in the voice of this kind of creepy... Like, you know, fan girl, gee golly whiz. It's like, yes. oh, gee, gee, Mr. Pyre. Gee, yeah, Doom Patrol is the coolest thing ever. Grant Morrison's a genius. Oh, it's so wonderful. I hope he writes it ever and ever. If he gets sick or dies, can I write it? Yeah. It was very good. <laughs> I waited, I waited oh, to write it. You know? Yeah, it, it was and such then, a good tone. And yeah. then Tom read it. And he just loved it. He called me up immediately. He said, this is just great. He said, why don't you do one of these a month? <laughs> it's so much so time to write. And then for the last month, we'll say, you got the job, right? Okay, yeah. so I just keep doing this. It's like three months, three or four months. And they get more and more aggressive, more and more extreme. So the next to last one I write, hey, what did I get to write Doom Patrol? You know, you think I'm just a kid, but I have friends, you know. You wouldn't want your head to put that stuff in a toilet, would you? You don't want to sugar with your gas tank, do you? <laughs> <laughs> I, I so, love then, this intro. So, the, so the last letter, which is to write in the last episode of Grants, you know, when they announced me, the letter was, oh, gee, gee, Mr. Pyre, I'm so sorry. I got carried away. I'm so, so sorry, Mr. Pyre. I feel so bad. But, you know, the thing is, I told my mom I was doing it, and she told all her friends. And so Tom then writes his response. He says, well, she told her mom, what could we do? Rachel <laughs> Bolling is the new writer at Doom Patrol. <laughs> right, so then I, I wrote an article in my grown up serious voice about what a genius Grant Morrison is, you know? Yeah. And what a wonderful, amazing thing. Um, you know, Doom Patrol, his Doom Patrol was, and I compared it actually to Jack Kirby mm -hmm. and to Marvel Comics, uh, to Captain Marvel for that matter, actually. Because they, they had that same quality of just complete inspiration from nowhere. Yeah. Just, mm -hmm. you know, something deep inside. Anyway. And so I thought this would be obvious. This was the true me, right? Yes. And to this day, there are people who believe <laughs> I got their job at the stupid letters. Oh. <laughs> and I think because they want to believe, because they want to believe that's how you can get a job writing a major comic book, just writing letters to the editor. Yeah. And this is not just this is not just like you know kids. Oh, sure. I was at another party, and there was a guy there, a reporter from the Village Voice, another one from the New Yorker, and they said. So we understand you got the job by writing letters to letter column. I went, what? You know? <laughs> <laughs> and I still have people say that. It's, it's amazing. It's the power of a legend. We, uh, we, uh, Joe and I interviewed uh, Richard Case uh, quite some time ago now, but we, told, we talked a little bit about this story of, of just kind of the, the letter writer and how that introduced you. And I remember in the video we were talking about how it was, it was, it was clever. It was, it was, it was a, I thought it was a very neat way to, to do it. And I, I, I love the whole thing. But... Um, after we posted the interview, there was more than one comment and email that we got going, you guys got it wrong. Uh, she actually got the job from writing to the oh, uh, letter. Oh, my God. <laughs> Maybe that's Richard is the artist doesn't know. But yeah, I'm right. yeah. yeah. Oh, Lord, that's amazing. Wow. It, it's still going. I, yeah. It's power of a myth, I guess, you know? It, you know, it, you know? I, I think you're right. I think a lot of people love the idea of, of a fan could kind of write in and, and make it yeah. that way. And, uh, yeah, it's uh, a fantasy, yeah. Yeah, I, I now wonder how many how many uh, increasingly crazy letters have been written to editors. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be the writer of the Avengers. This is how we do it. Yeah, um, you know, I haven't. I have not looked at the recent incarnations of Doom Patrol and any letter columns. I guess to be online now. Yeah. But usually, to see if that's a place where that happens. I would hope so. Has so it happened it, once yeah. before with Doom Patrol? Some, some, you know, like, okay, I'm going to try to do what this Rachel Pollock did, you know, and <laughs> I'm writing letters to the letter columns. <laughs> you know, it's it's to some extent it's worked. There have been people who have tweeted out to companies like, "Hey, you know who should write this? Me." And um, okay. while that's probably not the whole story, uh, that that's a, a part of it. But um, but yeah, so you you got to take over from from Grant. What, did Grant give? Were there any uh, directives of things you could or couldn't do? 
only by way of the Editor's Empire. Mm -hmm. um, I have never actually had any personal contact with Grant, so all I have are suppositions. It, it felt to me like that he thought the series should end with him, mm -hmm. at least for a while, you know, yeah. Yeah. that he felt that, you know, he, he did one long story and it came to a real conclusion, which is, I, I certainly felt that way, you know, mm -hmm. what he did. Um, and then, but DC liked it and wanted to continue and I certainly was happy to do it. Mm -hmm. So, but, but Tom just told me very limited things. You know, he basically said how this, how the team ends up. Okay. One of the interesting things was he said that the chief ends up as a head without a body. And this actually was, Tom was taking this too literally, I, I, I get the impression, because <laughs> it was based on a story, a, a one-off, you know, long, large episode that was written. Um, and and in, indeed, in that particular story, um, the chief, you know, is beheaded, right? And there's his head, you know? Mm -hmm. um, but Grant meant that as kind of a joke or a dream sequence. And that I guess he told Tom that this is how the chief ends, and Tom told me that's a literal thing. So there was that. I was told that I could not use um, Crazy Jane. Mm -hmm. That was very important to um, Grant, which is fair enough. I understood that completely. Mm -hmm. And also um, uh, Danny the Street I couldn't use. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's which, a um, Which was, again, something that Grant felt was a very special thing of his. Yeah. And then otherwise, you know, and I, I saw Dorothy was available and the chief as a head on some ice cubes. I, I had his head on ice cubes all the time. Yeah. Like, <laughs> and then he was drinking a milkshake and it would run down his neck. To yeah. the, ice cubes. The, the, the visuals were always incredible yeah. there. And that. what about Man Cliff Steele? Mm -hmm. um, and then Tom said to me, so we were going to use Negative Man. I think that was, I guess, I know it was off limits. I just thought that story was finished. Yeah. Know, for the moment. Anyway, so but but then Tom said, "Well, there has to be someone in bandages. Yeah. Doom Patrol always has to have someone in bandages, which is negative man, you know, mm -hmm. Larry Trainer, I guess was his name." Yeah. And so I came up with these as a man and woman in, in bandages, mm -hmm. George and Marion, and mm -hmm. not many people will know where those names come from. If you if you're a fan of old TV from the fifties, you might um, remember um, the Thin Man TV series, not the original mm -hmm. movies. Um, Peter Lawford and I forget the woman. And they were mm -hmm. always making martinis, very suave detectives, you know, husband yes. and husband. And so that's who George and Marion were. They were the ghosts, though. No, I'm not sorry. I'm confused. Topper. Topper right. had his ghosts. Mm -hmm. uh, Topper was a stick in the mud, stuffed shirt kind of guy. And the ghosts, George and Marion, were always like loosening him up. Yes. Right? Okay. And so that's who George and Marion were. They were based on the ghosts that were. Oh, with Topper. Nice. And so they represent, they came to represent for me, um, the people who enjoyed life, who did not let things stop them. Yeah. And, and then I had to introduce um, Kate Godwin, who yeah. had the secret identity name of Coagula for exactly three or four panels. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think that I think somehow the name got used again later. I can't remember exactly where. I was surprised the fact that I had done that. Yeah. Some, but, but really, this, the, whole, the name came. So here was her power. And he came from having sex with Larry Trainers. I got to sneak Larry Trainers in there once. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, you know, she was a hooker. And so she was a woman was transsexual back then, a transsexual woman. And she had, um, was a prostitute mm -hmm. and, and a software engineer. Yeah. And the reason for that was um, I knew a lot of trans people back then because I was in that movement. And basically those are the two most common professions. Sure. And it depends on class. If you were from the working class, you're out in the street, you tended to be a hooker. If you were middle class and a nerd, which a lot of them were, you tended to be a software engineer. Yep. And I was at some party once, and um, I met this trans woman, and I said, well, what's, what works you? She said, oh, I'm an engineer. I said, oh, a software engineer? She said, how did you know that? That's where everybody is. Anyway, so those are the two. So as a hooker part of Kate, she has sex with um, Larry Trainer. Yes. And he has all these alchemical powers. So he imparts to her the ability to, you know, there's a famous alchemical slogan, solve it, coagulate, dissolve and coagulate. Yeah. Left hand dissolves, right hand coagulates. So that's what her power was. Yeah. But really, her power was self acceptance. Yeah. And to not be afraid of being herself and, and not be afraid of the world's judgments of her. When, which, you know, George and Marion liked that, but for them, 
it was almost not exactly a caricature, but it was they were not presented as having overcome anything. But yeah, it was, a arc. it was a journey. It was a good. It was a powerful journey. I think that was a time when uh, Vertigo was doing. Uh, I mean, that was the nature of kind of how it launched. Some really powerful things. Um, yeah. were, uh, but they were investing in the effort of the stories they were telling. I, that's oh, yeah. maybe not said very well, but it was. Yeah. It no, wasn't. It was never cheap. It was never uh, rolled out as a you no. know as an intro caption, and then here you go. You're, they they put work into how it happened. That yeah, was, it was a it was a great effort, you know. Yeah, um, and you know, it, I was so happy to be doing that. You know, um, Grant's Vertigo, Grant's um, Doom Patrol was not Vertigo. Yeah. Vertigo actually started after he left, and I so I was one of the very first right. Vertigo writers. You know, I was following, following Grant, and. Um, Okay, one more thing about George and Marion and then mm-hmm. in, in the episode introduced Kate, it begins with um, George and Marion decide to go for, uh, you know, a walk in the town. They go into the city. They're living in a suburb. Actually, they're living in Rhinebeck, where I live. <laughs> but they decide to go into the city and have some fun. And um, they invite um, Cliff, Robot Man, and Dorothy, who, you know, is, considers herself horribly ugly because she, she just yes. she resembles uh, you know, basically an ape, you know? And so she's very upset about this all the time. People make fun of her. Anyway, and so you know, they said, you want to come? And the two of them, you know, say no, 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 we're going to stay home. We're not, we're not going to do that. And then one of them, I think it's Dorothy, says to George and Marion, how can you stand it? And they, and they say, stand what? Well, you go out it's in the city, and like, everyone's staring at you all the time. Everyone's yeah. looking at you. as you weird. You're a freak. How can you stand it? And so one of them says, well, we think we have two choices. Either we can hide in the house and not have it, people stare at us, or we can go out and have a good time. Yeah. The rest of the choice is really easy. Yeah. So that sets up the whole idea. Uh, and that's so then when Kate comes in and defeats this ridiculous enemy, um, you know, with this um, mm-hmm. card piece, this ridiculous yeah. Villain, yeah. Um, they say they say there's something like, you know, I think you're our kind of person. Why don't you come with us? <laughs> you might yes. want to join the Doom Patrol. <laughs> so that's how that happened. But so from those two figures and then from Kate, what the setup was the idea that if you stop being ashamed of yourself and stop worrying about who's going to look at you and think you're weird and sick or whatever, then you can have life. You can have, be alive. And otherwise, you just end up always being frightened of what other people think of you. I mean, that's a great... It, it's, it's a good message on two levels. I think it, it fits... Um, it fits superhero comics because the the idea of these heroes who are doing something bigger than themselves having yeah. to decide and and, and then rise to the challenge. This is uh, similar of of you know worrying less about external factors and more about just yeah. being confident in yourself. And I, I I like I like that. I like the theme that came across. And this was really early in your run. You established this very quickly. Um, it was actually there were quite a few episodes before I got to that one. Yeah, and I. I was doing things that I, I since came decided to change. Um, oh. I was completely like hardcore. I don't have to explain anything. Oh. If it's available somewhere in the public, you know, history of civilization, I can do it, and people can just find it for themselves. Okay. <laughs> Which is, yeah, I I was inspired by James Joyce, one of the most you know greatest avant-garde novels of all time, but oh, not the usual inspiration for comic books. You know? uh. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I thought you know I had to actually get out of doing that. And so there were certain things I thought that were too obscure and too bizarre. Uh, but I was following Grant. A lot of stuff that Grant did was fairly incomprehensible at times. <laughs> not, not, not as extreme as what I was doing, but still, you know, I was that no concession attitude I got from him. Um, yeah. but then, um, I guess that the issue with Cockpit may have been, I think Tom was still, still there, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, sure. But no, I didn't want to do a single issue story. Because I like the idea of arcs going over four and five issues. You really develop the yeah. story. Um, but I thought, okay. And so I came up with a story that that one and then one or two other ones ended up being, I thought, the best, one of, some of the best stuff I did at Doom Patrol was a single issue stories. And, and Codpiece was a riff on uh, like the old, like what, Silver Age, Green Arrow kind of yeah. stuff. Yeah. yeah. So Green Arrow, at those, when I was a kid, again, I was reading these things. And I'm not sure I ever thought about this question, but you know, he had this quiver, right? This little narrow quiver of arrows, mm-hmm. right? And out of that quiver would come a huge boxing glove arrow. Yes. <laughs> a rocket arrow. <laughs> you know? Yes, it made no sense. 
a grappling hook arrow. Yeah. <laughs> and, that, and someone once wrote a letter column and said, how does a green arrow fit all those gigantic arrows <laughs> into his little quiver? <laughs> and the answer was something like, um, well, that has to be a green arrow's secret. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, Convenient, yeah. So I just, I don't know what made me want to play with that, but I thought of like a villain who has that kind of ridiculous kind of, you know, yeah. armory. And, yeah. and then because I was dealing with issues of sexuality and self-acceptance, I came up with this girl. First, I just, I just liked the idea of a cod piece, you know, mm-hmm. this thing that men used to wear a little bit times over their groin to make them look like they were a big deal, you know? Yeah. Um, and, you know, they were so gigantic, they had to contain it in this thing. Anyway, I just thought that'd be fun to have that be a... a they could come back any day now, yeah. A camp yeah. kind, you know? And yeah, yeah. and um, one interesting thing, since we're talking about villains from, from Doom Patrol... Uh, unlike, I think, a lot of other Doom Patrol run, or really any Doom Patrol run, <laughs> and and most runs of any comic, <laughs> um, you didn't go back in the well to basically any of, of Doom Patrol's old villains. Like, you didn't bring back, like, General Amortis or, or no. you know, Madame Rouge or, you know, um, the original Brotherhood or Mr. Nobody. Like, none of... None of you went new. Those, yeah, it, you... Basically, did all new villains or, or, or reinterpretations of, of well, I was inspired by Grant Morrison also. Yeah, you know the villains I remember are Mister Nobody, yeah, you know, Mister Nobody for president, mm-hmm. no, nobody for president, which is great. That's slogan, yes, you know? <laughs> and then um, and then the painting that ate Paris, which is so brilliant, mm-hmm. you know. But that and now I'm just going to say something about that for a moment because it so inspired me. That's mm-hmm. so, so mm-hmm. you know, has, you know and Grant had gone to art school. He that's what he studied. He actually studied art rather than writing in school. And so he basically that storyline is all the avant-garde French traditions cycling through it. The surrealists and the Dadaists and so on. Mm-hmm. Um, and then it, it ends with um, with Dada. And then this, so this painting is just devouring the city of Paris. Mm-hmm. It's, it's modern art. is devouring the city of Paris. And then, um, and then when the final version is Dada, which is nothing. Nothing. Right you know, it's just empty, right? And so... Um, but here's what he did that was so incredible. So the way, you know, so Crazy Jane has been established. The reason for Crazy Jane's, you know, multiple personality split was some sort of horrible abuse from her father. Well, I don't think it was ever specified, but presumably sexual and violent. Yeah. And that's sadly a common story, you mm-hmm. know. Um, but, anyway, but anyway, that's a whole other issue there. Yeah. But for multiple personality, I know some multiple personality people. So it's, it's, it's a powerful issue. But anyway, yeah. but that was the storyline, right? So so then she, so she goes in into the painting to save Paris, right? And so she has to call out um, the enemy. So mm-hmm. she has to call out, da da, da da, da da. Yeah. And then she does it, but she sings in this complete few state because now she's back with her father, da da. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's so brilliant, you know? Yes. The next episode is the one where Cliff is on a subway train in mm-hmm. Manhattan. And the subway train is her. Yeah. And yeah. stuck in the Dada tunnel. So I was so inspired by that kind of villain. Yes. And that kind of storyline. I want to do that kind of thing. Um, and so the thing about um, Codpiece, well, she was the opposite of, of basically of, um, the Doom Patrol, but particularly of um, Kate. Yeah. Because he was someone who completely, his life was dominated by what he thought was sexual rejection. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the basic origin story, you know, he's a kid in high school and he asks this girl to the prom. She won't go. And he says, why? Why would you go out with me? She says, um, uh, because you're too small. Yeah. And she walks away. And her friend says to her, why don't you tell him? She says, oh, I don't know. I don't remember. I just, whatever came to mind. Yeah, but for him, this is devastating. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. He thinks it's an attack on his sexuality. Right. The whole rest of his life, he's trying to. He's full of anger about this, right? And he goes to this prostitute, and she said, "Well, if you're worried about being small, why don't you just wear something?" Mm-hmm. So he invents. I'll wear something. He invents this cannon. Yeah. So he's the example of the person who's wounded by feeling sexually inadequate, and rejected, and feeling like a freak. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and then Kate is the example of the person who um, is a freak, but just deals with it by just being herself. And so that was, that for me, was the essence of it. But of course, people were getting all worked up about the card piece thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, people ask, like, I often get asked, did DC object to the introduction of a transsexual lesbian superhero? 
And I said, no, actually, the thing that they were, had concerns with was cod piece. Because mm-hmm. that was more graphic. Yeah, right. The other one was conceptual. But, um, and, and the issue, and so, you know, Tom and I, I think, I'm pretty sure it was Tom, had to, you know, see, get, had to get permission, right? Mm-hmm. And the, the issue was the cover, really. Yeah. What yeah. the pictures on the cover, um, and so, and so, the, and they actually did a photographic cover. It's amazing. So they have this guy modeling the character, mm-hmm. and then it's like a drawn a, a cannon on his groin, you know, and these two young women are looking admiringly down at his cannon. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so, but what, what DC said was, "Well, okay, as long as it's not too long." I <laughs> 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 was compromise with public morality, which I just loved. No, that's great. Um, they had Tom Taggart did some incredible uh, covers like that, and yeah. then um, so then after Tom, you worked with uh, Lou Stathis, right? Yes, yeah, yeah. Lou, uh, kind of sh- Lou shaped me up. Yeah, Lou, t- tell us a little more about him because um, he passed away far too oh, young. Yeah. And, oh, yeah. mm-hmm. terrible loss. Yeah, um, Lou kind of was the one who said, "Look, you know." This is great. You're having lots of fun, but people have to understand what you're doing. Mm-hmm. So he like took me to task and started making me do more concept. Things followed through better. So oh, I really cool. thought that it really came to its full development under Lou's direction. Yeah. Um, and it, with some kind of then we worked, one of the people we worked with, of course, was um, okay. Mine's blanking. Joe, who was the great artist we worked with? Ted McKeever. Ted McKeever. Yeah. yeah. Terrible. Okay. And so, but this is an interesting process because I would do a script. I tended to do what I think of a semi-full script. Because mm-hmm. my examples actually were Alan Moore and Neil Gaiman and um, Grant Morrison. Yeah. Who each in their own way did basically a panel-by-panel full mm-hmm. script, script. So that's what I did. So then I would send this to Ted. He would send back whatever he wanted, basically. <laughs> <laughs> you kind of follow it, right? But, you know, he, some panel I would describe in great detail would just have a blurred image of somebody. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Mm-hmm. And next panel would be he wanted to do, and he was much fuller. So then we would get, so then Lou and I would go over it and figure out where we'd have to fill in with dialogue the stuff that Ted had not made clear in the pictures. Yeah. And that was just, that was fine. It was a good process to work, you know? Yeah. And did you, uh, you, you talk to Ted on the phone for, for some of the stuff to work no, it out? Or? Not much. No. I, I can't remember what contact we had at all. I don't know. I mean, I, I, we probably had like some email contact, I think. Yeah, this is an area, I, I, I'm wrong. Maybe I'm just forgetting something, but I don't remember talking much. Yeah, people, it, I think people it, it, people struggle today uh, trying to understand that relationship between the writer and great. I think it's changed quite a bit, mm-hmm. uh, the editor writer yeah. kind of relationship and all that stuff. So, but this is fascinating. So you're you're very limited contact with the artist, mm-hmm. um, but your editor is really working with you to kind yeah. of put the piece together. And yeah, yeah, yeah. The editor was definitely the go between. You know. Lou is definitely the thing that cemented everything. Um, but I mean, I was working with the artist in the sense of seeing the work he did. Mm-hmm. And it didn't yeah. take very long to figure out, you know, with Ted, how we had to do things. Well, was um, it Ted's idea to do the full on, like, um, I think this was when um, Kate and uh, Robot Man fused together, yeah. of just having the big robot dick in, in that one panel? Um, you know, I, I'm pretty sure that was Ted. <laughs> but it mm-hmm. might have been me suggesting it, or it yeah. might have been Ted running with something I suggested in the, in, the, in the small way, shall we say? <laughs> yeah, but uh, and yeah. it's a great image. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it yeah. is. And uh, you, you know, on, on that too, um, he he was also the artist on the issue, uh, and, and I thought this issue was really great. I'm blanking on the number, but it was when um, Robot Man ends up accidentally finding out from George and Marion that uh, Kate's trans because they assumed he oh, knew. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And then he confronts her about it and yeah. she delivers that great bit of, of just like, well, do you consider yourself a man? Well, you, you're a robot. Like, mm-hmm. uh, it's more graphic than that, you know? Yeah, I know. It was, yeah, yeah. I mean, he said something like, you, know, you used to have a penis, you used to have a dick, you know? Yeah. And she goes, what about you? Do you have a penis? you have a dick, you know? Because he does. He's a robot body. Mm-hmm. Yeah. If, he had a, if he had a penis, it would be a fake, it would be a steel penis or whatever, you know? Right. So, you know, she gets him to see how ridiculous he's being. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But for someone in his position to be basing something on people's biology, particularly. And it's so concise and done. It's That exchange is basically done in one page. Yeah. And, yeah. and I feel like it's something that uh, people struggle with 
today in comics, because you see people try to tackle this in comics yeah. today, and yeah. they struggle to tell that in one issue, and, and you do it in uh, yeah. one page. Well, I mean, we'd already established who Kate was. So we yeah, yeah. Introducing a trans character and then having to deal with that stuff. Yeah. And, and we'd also establish in a sense that she kind of takes no prisoners. Mm -hmm. actually, she's not hostile, she's not aggressive, but what she does is she, how to say it, that she, um, she doesn't like feel that she has to defend herself. Right. You know, she doesn't feel like she has to like convince people of anything. Yeah. That's who she is, and they, and they can just deal with that. That's that's their problem. No, it's very, it's it's uh, it's to the point. Maybe that's the. <laughs> there's, yeah. Good phrase, like, yeah. I like uh, I like the. I was thinking before we did this interview, I was trying to, to think about how to kind of frame up this question because it, it's a weird, it's a weird one. It's a hard one. And it's, um, there were so many, I think, very kind of powerful uh, statements and, uh, and, and characters being used and LGBTQ issues that were addressed. And a lot of this in the, in the early nineties and, and even before in the eighties, there were it's several independent comics that were tackling uh, this yeah. kind of material and, yeah. and tackling it really well. Uh -huh. And there's a perception today in the last four years or so that nothing was done before. That there's a yeah, it's always the case, isn't it? You know, it's just yeah. And it yeah, it, it's it's not little, just, it, it is. It, it drives me a little nuts, and I because I feel like not only was it done before uh, many times, yeah. the the customer base, the fans were largely accepting of this. I mean, there, there wasn't this big outcry that, that you know, no. Um, I just, I remember running a shop in the early nineties. We were stocking your book. I remember lots of people coming in to buy it and, and, you know, grants before that, and they were enjoying the stories. It was, it was pretty, there was never, there's, I had never had a company come in and put the comic book on the shelf or, or on the counter and say, well, I can't deal with any of this. This isn't a, this no. isn't a straight white superhero. You got to take it back. Nobody ever did that. No, no. Um, the, the objections we got from my run were not. Nothing at all about that. They're all only about um well the people did object to what they thought was my extreme feminism. Yeah. And some fans thought that um I don't think it was because I was queer or I was writing about queer subjects. They just thought that I was somehow putting them down because they were men. Yeah. And fans. And I, I kinda get that because comic book fans, the cliche of them was really insulting. Sure. You know, yeah. They were these, you know, overweight nerds who lived in their mother's basements. Yeah. And never had a date in their lives, you know? And, and, and it's kind of insulting. And it's just not true, of course. As no, well. exactly. It's, yeah. it's and it's almost why I get this um this irritation with this way it's framed up today, like Yeah, I know. Yeah, before two thousand fifteen, all the yeah. bad yeah. nerds in the basements, but now now we're doing something. And now we're always, woke. <laughs> yeah, it just it feels very respectful <laughs> to everything. I, I but I'll tell you, Pritchett, to be honest, to be fair, you know, I and lots of people felt that way in the 70s. For sure. The yeah. Gay Liberation, the Gay Liberation Front, and the street demonstrations, and Stonewall. You know, there was a movie called Before Stonewall that came out in the 80s, I guess, and it was wonderful. It was beautiful. Because mm -hmm. it just showed, you know, the powerful, you know, kind of slightly hidden, but there, gay life of Before Stonewall. Mm-hmm. And some really wonderful stories that came to that. And so, you know, I certainly see that now. I mean, you know, you, you see a comic, some comic will have a trans superhero say, the first ever trans yeah. superhero. So, uh, no, no, that's not true. You know, Rachel Pollack did it in the 90s. And then um, just recently, I read a novel, a thriller, and it said this was the first ever thriller. Uh, with a trans detective written by a trans woman, trans mm -hmm. detective, and, and I felt like writing up. Uh, nope, sorry, yeah. <laughs> I did it in the mid nineties, <laughs> <laughs> decades earlier. I mean, it, it, it's I, 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 on one hand, I, I don't get the obsession of wanting to be first, and it's like we we've got to be first. And then on the other end, you know, as Joe put it well, like you you very effectively tackled this issue in a page. Yeah. And and meanwhile, we're now or not now, and this is unfair. There's certainly people doing good work. It's, it's I'm not saying it's all broken, <laughs> but it is. Uh, it's it's to see something that has to you know engage a marketing machine. We've got to do 50 press releases about how this this is the most important thing in the yeah yeah sure yeah. It, it just it's it seems like we got 
backwards somehow. And I, I, yeah. I do feel for the comic fans who, uh, you know, and I, I hear for a lot of them say, I'm not, I don't really have a side in this culture war, but back in the, in the eighties and nineties, I was enjoying this kind of stuff. And so it's very strange for me to now hear that, uh, you know, I, I was wrong somehow. And, you know, we got to get rid of me. It, it's just, it's a strange dynamic that's cropped up. Yeah. I, that, that's, to me, it just seems like it's something natural, you know, a new generation, you know, sort of takes the barricades and they just want to believe they're the first and no one's ever done it before. Sure. Yeah. And like I said, we've thought that way in the seventies and eighties, you know, so I, true. I, 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 like, you know? I like that. I like, I mean, that's yeah. a good perspective. It is, it is a cycle. Yeah, sure. yeah, yeah. You know, and um, another interesting thing too for for all of the uh, press releases you see today, for all of those kind of announcements where they're like, "We're finally gonna have a, yeah. a, a trans superhero or some kind of other <laughs> queer hero yeah, or something yeah. like that," for all of that, to this day, you are the only openly trans writer to get a run on a main book at the, cause you got to write uh, new gods. That's true. Yeah. yeah. So I've, everyone else like, um, uh, what was it? Um, and, and this is not to uh, mm. disparage the work of other people, you, you know, like Caitlin R. Kiernan's uh, work at DC was exclusively at Vertigo. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Lila Sturgis did, you know, great work. She wasn't out at the time and, and she was brought in usually to close out runs mm -hmm. or close out main runs or yeah, like a specialty jump. Yeah. Yeah. Or, or, or she did a lot of stuff at uh, vertigo, mm -hmm. um, you know, which again, not taking anything away from that. I love Lila. She's, she's wonderful. And then, um, you know, same thing with, uh, in, you know, people like Mags, they've done, uh, well, she's done a uh, mini series. She's done stuff with like, y you know, a young animal, uh, one shots mm -hmm. to people. They roll it out and act like it's, they're being big and progressive. And this is a big feat, yeah, yeah. but the they have the, company. yeah, the, the companies, yeah. not the, yeah. not the creators, of course, no, no the companies, the, yeah. the companies and the people doing the press releases and the, and the reporting on this. And to this day, almost like, yeah, over 25 years ago, I think, or about 25 years ago at this point, you are still the only openly <laughs> trans writer at either Marvel or DC <laughs> to write a run on their main lines. Yeah, and one of their main traditional characters and storylines. Yeah. Yeah. You guys, is, you know, a real specialty. That came from Tom Pyre also. Tom had been commissioned to do a yeah. New Gods, and he said, well, Rachel, do it with me. Yeah. And that was great. And then he dropped out and I did it by myself. Yeah. And um, I think I was at Crystal Frazier is doing, um, and, and uh, she's an openly trans writer, but that's a mini series that's following up uh, the Immortal Hulk. So. Oh, really? Okay. That's cool. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. yeah Gamma Flight. Yeah. Uh, with co writing it with Al Ewing. And, and again, that's cool. And this is great. And this should be celebrated. Mm -hmm. It's just crazy that it's still, they did something. That 25 years ago, twenty five years ago, that was you know was an actual run because you wrote like eleven issues of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That yeah, was a year. Yeah, yeah. I was uh, like, yeah, that was interesting to write a mainstream comic at that time. Yeah, because I had no control over the art. I had mm -hmm. the artist that they chose, and I hated it. I hated the art. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was all these ridiculous, deformed women's bodies. <laughs> you, know, these, you know, tiny. Five inch waist and gigantic butts and gigantic breasts, and somehow both were sticking out at the reader at the same time. Yeah, <laughs> so, so that was it. Those, those were early experimentations in 3D on the page. That's what was, was no. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Just, well, I'll tell you something in what you were saying, what Joe was saying. Yeah, there are one group of people who do remember that, and that's um, queer people who want to write comics, yeah, particularly young trans people who want to write comics, and they know Doom Patrol. Mm -hmm. they, don't, they don't really. I don't know how much some of them know about my new gossip, but Doom Patrol. You know, I, I thought it was kind of forgotten years ago, and yeah. you know, and then um, I was asked to be one of the uh, main speakers at a um, congress on uh, transgender literature in Canada. Mm -hmm. really, bad, really wonderful people there, and again, I thought, well, you know, anyone who remembers me, I did some articles in the nineties. Which had a big impact, but you know, it's long ago, and some other stuff, you know. And I get there, and it turns out that I was a hero to this whole generation of young trans um, comics writers and artists. 
And that was a really wonderful experience. I got to talk about doing that and doing patrol and what it meant. And, but it was just very exciting to have that recognition. I had no idea this was happening. This whole That's generation of people. I, I uh, speaking of New God. So, so first, I I, I loved your Doom Patrol work um, for sure. I but and you you kind of mentioned you know it, the, the the art art issues aside. Uh, the, what what was the for people who are thinking what what was the critical difference between <laughs> Vertigo and you know you come out of this now you got Superman as a character you're you're putting on the page and well, I was like, fine Superman I guess okay, I to write Superman just for a couple of pages as well. that was just great yeah. You know? yeah the origin of everything yeah. Um, well, you know, you had a more action oriented. Yeah. You had the same level of social commentary and things like that. It had to be somewhat more accessible, obviously, than just a wild, surreal type of set to be doing Vertigo. Mm -hmm. um, but my focus in writing New Cause was to try to remember that what, what Kirby was doing was doing something very real. Mm -hmm. just, because this most version of New Cause since Kirby had just been like, you know, um, superheroes on steroids. Yeah. Even more superhero than the superheroes. But for Kirby, they were obviously they were gods. They were not just superheroes. So I really tried to focus on that and what were the god issues between them. There's a lot of people who remember this run fondly. I, I know that um, I, it's, it's one of those pieces where I think that uh, the new gods and kind of these characters and everything that uh, was going on at the time, I think there's a feeling that's been underserved uh, over the years. It, you know, they, they kind of experiment with it, but then they yeah. kind of lean back on the you know the the classic characters or the you know the the, the the bread and butter I guess of the company. Yeah, yeah. Um, but your run comes up quite a bit actually a lot. You know, uh, uh, being Good. something people really remember and and they like kind of that spirit. So it's. Uh, I, I tell you a storyline I really want to do. So you know, the whole thing about um, Orion, is the son of um, Darkseid, who yes. is raised by High Father. So he's like both sides, right? He's like the good and evil side, you know. And he has two faces. He has like this this beautiful. You know, face with the new god side, and then his twisted, nasty face with yes. the um, dark side of dark side. <laughs> anyway, um, the dark side. Yeah. And so I had this idea that he would not only take over both planets, you know, and rule of them, but he would then have Two Face as his chief chief advisor. Yes. Mm -hmm. He would bring Two Face up from Earth and have him be his advisor. I thought that would just be such a great thing to do. Yeah, the yeah. person in the universe who knew understood him. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, and would be this Earth super villain, you know. But I didn't get to get there because run ended. Yeah, and it ended basically because, as I understand it, John Byrne wanted to do it. Yeah, no, he and took so, over immediately. Yeah, after. and he just you know so what John Byrne wanted, John Byrne got at that time. Yeah, uh, which I understand, you know. It was DC it was a commercial business, and he was a big star, so why not? Yeah. But, you know, it was also, I, 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 like, I like to joke that if um, I would have quit in process if, they, process if they hadn't fired me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I really had problems with some of the art and the, the way they yeah. portrayed women. I, I did not like my name on a comic that was showing women that way. Yeah. It was very – well, I mean, it, it was a – it was right in a category where that was all the art. I mean, not, not all of it, but I mean, there was, there was very much a yeah. house style or, or there was, a, there yeah. was a, it, it, that's, that's maybe more most memorable as you, as you look at a lot of those pages. And I mean, even, um, I mean, the artist has gone on to change the style quite a bit in, in you know, today. It, it's like everybody was being funneled into this same yeah. kind of style of work. It was, uh, yeah. but yeah. then you did some work with Keith Giffen as well, I think on there. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That was great. Yeah. Keith, Keith was always. I, yeah. You know. And he was the person. He did not do. The, I think DC Comics did more full script, and Marvel did, of course, you know, the, the just rough, rough outline, and the artist does the breakdown and so on. And Keith was a Marvel person, so in that sense. So he just, you know, he didn't want to have me do it panel by panel. And so he just, I sent him basically, you know, a rough several pages, do what you want here, do what you want here. And he came up with such great ideas. Yeah. Uh, which that was my favorite issue, one of my favorite issues. That yeah. Did. It definitely it, it felt like it fit the story at that point. Yeah. Like writing yeah. and the art was actually coming together to, yeah, you know, much, to yeah. visualize what you were saying. Um yeah, the the very nineties, uh yeah, it was it was, it was the nineties. And I, yeah. I don't mean can't wave this time. It's like the, the, the most memorable thing you can say about this is there were 40 other comics that month that looked exactly like this. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, at one point, Nuhas introduced a character based on the goddess um, Athena from Greece. Mm -hmm. And Athena is, you know, she's kind of sexless, 
she's a warrior in intellect and she's very pure, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, so, and I, my character called Atene, which is really the Greek pronunciation of her name. Mm -hmm. So I described her to the artist, as I said, um, she's tall and thin, and she, you know, has, you know, very flat-chested <laughs> and, um, and skinny, yeah. and she's the kind of person who was raised in a nunnery, and um, she's covered in head to toe, and, you know, believes in reading philosophy for fun or something like that. I'm going to make it really extreme, right? A warrior archer. Uh, so I get back this hot babe <laughs> in a torn tunic. <laughs> well, that's the right. kind of people who were going to the library back then. It's, yeah, uh, right, exactly. So, yeah. Yeah. You know, no, yeah. and um, you also got to work with, um, I think uh, it was Mike Allred's first DC work on uh, Brother Power of the Geek. Work, right? yeah. Yeah. It was his first work, yeah. That was great, too. Interesting artist, yeah. Yeah, what, what inspired that story for you? Um, I'm trying to remember if I said... I don't think I said I wanted that one. I think that DC said, would you like to do a one shot of this character? Mm -hmm. um, you know, Jack Kirby invented it as this mm -hmm. weird idea of it's like, you know, his, his idea of engaging the hippies. Because, mm -hmm. you know, he was an older generation. They were kind of alien to him. And then um, Neil developed it. And Neil was take, riffing on Alan Moore's idea of everything having an elemental. Yeah. So, you know, um, you know so for Neil, a brother power... Um, was the doll elemental. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. So he was all dolls. So I would think that. But then the geek thing, the term geek um, comes from carnivals. Right. And the geek was, technically the geek was someone who bit the head off chickens mm -hmm. to freak people out. You know, oh, 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 yeah. you know? And kind of disgusting. Shock. Yeah. Yeah, very disgusting. And, and obviously the geek was often, obviously someone who was perhaps, you know, uh, mentally backward in some way or some other kind of way that didn't fit in. They say, hey, you're doing this, you know? Mm -hmm. So to me, it then became about abuse. Yeah. People were being abused. So this was, this was the issue. I was saying to Joe recently that pretty much everything I did in comics, there was a real issue there Yeah. that I was looking at and trying to deal with, you know, in a very story, strong story, I thought. And so that was what that storyline was about. And it was even more than him, it was demonstrated um, by this young woman that he becomes friendly with. Mm -hmm. And she's an abuse survivor, and she's a prostitute. And she's with other women in that situation. And they're like trying to form a covenant of wishes to reclaim their power. Um, and then the woman was someone who called himself Dr. Abuse. Mm -hmm. And he was this, you know, very powerful mind control kind of person. And he was inspired by this amazing story that a friend of mine in London told me back in the, I guess around 71 or so. And so she told me about um, this man, and he was a high up uh, person in the conservative party. And my friend said, you know, if I told you his name, you would know who he was immediately. He was that well known. And he was famous for hiring rent boys. Oh. As they would call young male prostitutes back yeah. in the maybe still do. And so what he did, and so the so one of these young men was hired, right? And he goes there, and he says, you know, my friend's speaking to a day or two later, so what, what was it like? And he said, well, uh, he didn't touch me. We didn't have sex of any kind. We had dinner. It was a beautiful dinner and really nice wine. And at the end of it, he... And, then, and, and he always did was talk to me, the young the guy said, you know. And at the end, he said, um, he showed me this bowl of diamonds, obviously really good-sized diamonds. I said, take one. Oh, man. That's your fee, you know. And so the, the kid took it. And then he said to my friend, he said, I hope I never, ever, ever do that again. He said it was the worst experience he ever had in his life. Because this man could bore into anyone's Basically, all their weaknesses, their fears, their right. self-hate, and just talk to them. And just stir it up so they just wanted to kill themselves. Oh, my God. And you could, you know, how, you just could, this kid had just stagger out of there, you know? And so that was, I just wanted to write that character, and that became the villain. <laughs> yeah, that's story. great. <laughs> Dr. Abuse, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, wow. How can we do anyone into that terrible state? Yeah, I... I <laughs> And then recently, I, when the Trump administration, I started reviving that character um, and having it be President, President Trump. Mm -hmm. you know? 
the you know, Dr. Jesus Morphs is now the president of the United States. <laughs> I'm still struck by, I just, um, and again, for all these stories, there's, uh, there's so much work that's going into them that you're putting in to, to clarify the characters. There's no shorthand. There's no, um, you know, there, again, there's no caption descriptions. You're, you're making yeah. people, uh, you're, you're, you're selling your concept by, defining it and, and showing the beats and showing how things get there and, and, and making, making your point. And it's, it's more work. I mean, I think it takes a more talented person to do it, but it's, it's, it then lasts. I mean, you know, Joe and I hear uh, when we do uh, various kind of wrap ups, people reference brother power, of the geek and that story it's on people's minds now, 20, almost 25 years later. Yeah. Mm -hmm. wow. and, yeah. yeah. And it, and it's, it's, uh, it's very impressive. Just you're, you're putting in the, you put in the work and I, Let's circle all the way back to the beginning. But when you're talking about Kirby and kind of drawing inspiration from things, yeah, yeah. it's it's as if, um, and I think maybe the same, yeah, not maybe, I think the same thing's true of yourself. It, it just feels like you're uh, you're always thinking. So you're experiencing yeah, the true. world, you're looking at things, and then you're always thinking, how is this going to be a novel? How is this going to be a comic? Or it's, yeah. it's, it comes naturally, I guess. Mm -hmm. you know? Well, I read so widely, usually mythology and fantasy, but literary work as well, sometimes experimental work, all sorts of things, poetry. And I do tend to not say, okay, how am I going to use that? But I tend, it's it's in there in this kind of storehouse of possibilities of things that, yeah, sometimes definitely, oh, wow, this would make a great story, you know. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's, it's transferred to whatever I'm doing at the time. It, your, your work never felt cheap. It always felt earned. It, Thank it you. Felt, yeah. 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 What was interesting was something like Brother Power and Tomahawk and and obviously in Doom Patrol, the one issue up, the one episode storylines, well, because they did, you have to do it all in one story. Because, mm -hmm. you know, basically in Doom Patrol, there was a whole build up of, you know, hates reveal, we learned just a little bit about it, we learned more about it, and then we do a clip's reactions to her, and it goes over a lot of issues. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The one issue stories, you have to do everything in one story, and that, that's a kind of fascinating thing to do. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. yeah. Tough. It, and you also, um, you, you finally got to, I, I think, work directly with Stuart uh, on um, Time Breakers. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that was a great thing to do. Yeah. So, so how did that come about? Well, Stuart was starting a new line, and it was a science fiction line. Mm -hmm. It was obviously a kind of offshoot of Vertigo, hoping mm -hmm. to attract some of the same audiences for the some, you know, adult kind of writing and, and yeah. art. Um, but it was going to be science fiction, not fantasy and horror. Yeah. I think Vertigo's original impulse was horror, actually, but then yeah. branched out into fantasy. Um, so, but Stuart went, and so Stuart approached me and said, you know, um, you know, would you like to do science? You know, I was a science fiction writer. And I've been fascinated for years, and so I'm fascinated by time travel stories. I love time travel stories. Mm -hmm. And the idea of time paradoxes, you know, yeah. change in the past. And so what came to mind was, in almost all time travel stories, when there's a series, there's a recent television show about this. So the time travelers have to go back into the past to clean up a paradox. So mm -hmm. the villain often has gone back and made a paradox. You know, um, like what happens if you kill President Lincoln before he finishes the Civil War, something like that. You know, yeah. how will the future be changed? So the heroes go back in time to stop this from happening. So things have to. So history has to be preserved, right? Mm -hmm. So my idea was that. The universe runs on time paradoxes, on impossibilities. So not just changing something that would different, but making things impossible. Yes. So things that the energy just doesn't click, it doesn't work. Yeah. And so, so the time breakers, that's what they do. They go back in time and sometimes forward in time too, to create paradoxes that can't be explained. Mm -hmm. Because that's what keeps the universe alive instead of just a clockwork machine. Mm -hmm. And so I had a great time doing that and coming up with the ultimate paradox uh, at the end of it. And, yeah. Which was ultimately because if you accept it, then history becomes impossible. But as soon as history becomes impossible, then the paradox is gone. Right. Yeah. And then it's, then it's okay. And it just swings back and forth in this extreme way. And I was inspired by this amazing time travel story called Cryptozoic by Brian Aldiss back in the 80s, I guess, in England. Mm -hmm. All this was an amazing writer. He came out of the sort of classical science fiction writing, but then really took it into new places when the opportunity came up. So Cryptozoic is about a time traveler who travels back to the time of the dinosaurs. And there were two possible understandings of the story. 
One is that this is an account of the time traveler's experience. The other is, this is a psychotic imagining being a time traveler. Mm -hmm. And just as it seems convincing that, okay, this is actually a time traveler, and people are assuming he's psychotic, something happens, something is thrown at you, the reader, that, oh, no, wait, no, wait, actually, he's psychotic. Oh, okay. The time travel stuff is a fantasy. But as soon as you accept that, something happens. So I love that idea of like the swinging back and forth. That each thing makes the other side impossible. And that was the whole point of the time breaker story. But it was, it was just fun to do. Nice. And it was you, lots of fun to do. And you also worked on the uh, Vertigo Tarot deck, right? Yeah, that was an interesting idea. Um, Sharon, I can't remember her last name right now. Katua. Yeah, Sharon Katua. She was an editor at Vertigo, and she was a tarot fan. Mm -hmm. So she approached Karen Berg and said, hey, hey, you know, there's enough characters here to make a tarot deck. Yeah. Let's do a Vertigo tarot deck. Mm -hmm. And Karen liked the idea, so she talked with um, Neil, and Neil liked it a lot, and said, okay, we'll bring in Rachel. Because mm -hmm. Neil knew that, that I was a tarot person. And so um, the four of us had a conference on a weekend in a hotel in Manhattan, which was so much fun. And we um, just, just basically we decided in the so called major arcana, the 22 Trump. With titles like magician, mm high -hmm. priestess, etc., which characters those to be in what what moments in the storylines? Yeah. And so, um, you know, Neil and Karen wanted to be more Sam and everything else, and I kind of got that because that was their big seller. But I thought we should honor the other characters as well, so I managed to get the Doom Patrol card. I think the tower was yep. the tower of um, Babel in Doom Patrol, stuff mm -hmm. like that. And then. Um, so Neil's long-term partner, okay, mind blanking. Uh, yes, Dave McKean, of course. I, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, Dave's this brilliant artist. It's just incredible yeah. work. So he did the um, minor account of the four suits, um, mm -hmm. wands, cups, swords, and pentacles. Mm -hmm. And so that was all him, but I, I gave him some guidelines of ideas, mm -hmm. of what they were about. But he did this amazing, electro, you know, it's computer art, just a really great computer artist, and and then um, and I wrote the book, and the book was fun, and um, yeah. Dave laid out the book, which made it very difficult to read because the book was a work of art. Yes, it, have yeah. a page, it's and then really on the page, the page would be basically forty percent blank space. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Dave had the words set into like a, a figure of a body yeah. or something like this. It's beautiful to look at, but oh, yeah. it made the type very small. It it, it uh, that, that was great I, working with him. He's such. A, Brilliant artist. Oh, yeah. He was amazing. I, we sold so many of those. I was meaning to grab it. I, I've, I've got, I've got the copy. I mean, it was, it was a weird um, piece of merchandise. Cause I remember it sold very, very well. Yeah. And it sold to people who had no idea what Tara was. I, I remember a lot of people bought it for, you know, for the art or for Neil or, you know, the kind yeah. of these aspects of it. And um, I just remember there being so much confusion over what, wait, what did I buy? Exactly. It's great art, but what, what am I supposed to do? And, yeah. oh, the, and book, then, uh, the book gave a little bit of what tarot cards are about. Yes. So forth. Yes. The book yeah. helped. But then yeah. there again, I'm right. <laughs> you're, you're bringing back memories of people going, how, how am I supposed to read this? This is <laughs> uncomfortable to read. I, uh, I think yeah, I saw yeah. a lot of people in the library to, to research tarot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I've met tarotists, tarot people. And that's the only deck they use. I don't know if they mm -hmm. came to through Vertigo Comics, and, yeah. and that's how they came to the deck, but that's the deck they used, yeah. yeah. And, um, you know, go, going back to Doom Patrol, it ended at um, issue 87. Uh, there were a lot of Kyle Baker covers by the end of that. Yeah, um, yeah, wonderful. Yeah, which were great. Uh, Ted McKeever, I think, was basically on the last, like, year straight. I yeah, don't think there yeah. were really any fill-ins. No, well, you know, we had... Um, at least I can't remember what the single issue stories were. Yeah, we couldn't have the false memory was pretty late, so it had to be. A yeah, break. yeah. It was possibly funny. also clear, but like Steel might have been during Ted's run too. Yeah, well, um, you know, tell us a, bit, a little bit about the false memory because that was an interesting character. Yeah, that was a character I introduced very early, actually. Yeah, um, as a sort of side villain in one of the very earliest storylines, possibly the very first storyline, mm -hmm. and then. Um, when again I was asked to do a single issue, I came up with that idea of having that character come back and and be tempting the Doom Patrol into a kind of fugue state of separation from reality, but offering them these great fantasies of, of memories they would have loved to have had. Yeah. And then Kate, however, was the exception because um, her memories were terrible from childhood. Yeah. And so there was no attractive false memory. And so this yeah. put her at odds with the rest of the team. 
that she was dealing with painful false memories yeah. of, you know, of the abuse having conquered her rather than her overcoming it as she did in real life. And so that was interesting to have that, those two kinds of energies against each other. Yeah. Everyone else wanting to embrace the false memories and Kate's having to overcome them. It's, it's kind of like, it's different, um, but it's like a different take on something like um, Alan Moore's whatever, uh, Alan Moore's uh, For the Man Who Has Everything, mm. um, where, you, you know, uh, Mongol uh, traps Superman and, and he thinks he's going to uh, keep Superman yeah. asleep in a, a dream. Uh, giving him everything he wanted by having yeah. Krypton still being around, but um, it turns yeah. out to be awful, and mm. Superman's able to wake up because of how terrible that reality would have been. Oh, and, yeah. Uh, yeah, 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 it was wonderful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that was a, a great one. But yeah, that, and then one of the uh, aspects of your run that um, you see written about all all the time in terms of whenever people reference your run, they talk about the uh, Tiresias War. Mm. And uh, could, could you talk a little bit about that? Well, I want to say one thing about the false memory for a second, too. Oh, of course, of course. Yeah. So, one of the things about that uh, is that was a big issue at the time. Mm -hmm. You know, people were going through a lot of things around that. Mm -hmm. All those people who were in therapy and supposed all these memories are coming back that never actually happened. Mm -hmm. um, people who were going to jail for things that didn't ha ever occur. And so that was a big issue, what was real and what was not real. Yeah. Where people said they remembered something that they thought it, they never remembered, all of a sudden they remembered something. Was it actual, or were they just making something up and think it was a memory? So I was really, again, dealing with an actual subject at the time. Yeah. Um, so these wars were also an issue of, um, you know, how do we, how do we allow ourselves to change mm -hmm. and not get locked into one kind of being? Mm -hmm. How do we constantly open up to change? And the so. I came up with the idea that uh, Tiresias, who's a character in Greek mythology, mm -hmm. um, who changes, is a shepherd, and he sees um, two snakes copulating, and he, he either kills one or he throws his, he, he separates them with his stick, his shepherd staff, and zap, he's turned into a woman. Mm -hmm. And then seven years later, she sees the same thing, and she does something, and she's turned back into a man. Mm -hmm. So now we have a person who's seen both sides in the actual world. And then um, and then there's this silly kind of storyline, this myth that Zeus and Hera are fighting over who has, you know, the better of it in sex. Mm -hmm. And they're not bragging, they're trying to get one up on the other one. Yes. Yeah. And you're the one, you get all, you get all the pleasure. Mm -hmm. you know? So they say, okay, we're going to ask the only creature who knows both. <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. So they bring to you and they say, which is it? You know? And Theresia says, um, if sex was divided into 10 parts of pleasure, the woman has nine, the man has one. <laughs> <laughs> so you think that Hera would be saying, yay, but it's the opposite. Because yeah. each trying to get the, uh, over the other one. Says, you, you get all the pleasure. And so she's so furious, she strikes Theresia blind, and there's this uh, power in her sight. Well, this, yeah. of course, is just nonsense. You know? <laughs> and this is what's, you know, what's called a cover story um, for you know the ancient shamanic idea of Two things. First of all, inner sight being more powerful than outer sight. But also, um, many shamans change sex. Mm -hmm. And it's not something that they plan on doing. It's just it's something that, and, but sometimes you know, people who today would be transgender become shamans. So those things are entwined. So I was interested in that. This was a character, obviously, that would fit well with Kate. Mm -hmm. But then the other side, so I wanted to follow up on one of Grant's threads that he didn't do much with. Well, these characters called, um, I, maybe I think the builders maybe were my term, but some of the idea that there were these villains who were building the Tower of Babel mm -hmm. inside in the Pentagon or underneath the Pentagon, something like that. Yeah. So I just took that and really developed it. And so the Tower of Babel, in my mind, became this um, ancient battle between the Teresia, this portal of Teresias, mm -hmm. and the builders. Oh, nice. Okay. okay. And the builders were these people who wanted to fix everything into one category mm -hmm. and without any possibility of ever changing. And that was the Tower Babel was for, supposedly. Yeah. That, you know, and that would overcome. And so in the ancient times, the Tiresia destroyed it. And so now it's coming back. And so, and then the, and the Tiresia, um, he's been imprisoned, and I think it's Kate frees him, something, something frees him, you know. So he joins them, and then to defeat the builders, they have to overcome differences. Yeah. So 
that was that um, basically Kate and Cliff join together and become a Tiresias. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, they're sort of everything combined in one person. Yeah. And that's how they're able to defeat this. And if I'd been able to stay on, um, I had to play deal for an offshoot, maybe oh. a single episode thing, or like, you know, or maybe like a five episode independent mm-hmm. story in which Kate and um, and uh, Elliot, the Tiresias, uh, travel across America. Mm-hmm. And all the ways in which America is struggling with identity and, yeah. and you know, and categories and, and isolation and separation. And, you know, you're this group, or you're that group. And, and so that would have been a fun thing to do. And I, it's a shame I didn't get to do it. I would, <laughs> yeah, you know, speaking of, um, you know, it, it ended at issue 87, and now uh, Lou Stathis had passed away, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and then the book just, um, they just canceled it? You know, it's very odd. I don't remember exactly uh, what happened at the end. I don't remember if someone took over. I was... You, was, no one took over for yeah. a little bit, um, yeah, and I then they think, moved I it. Think, no, I think I'm going to cancel anyway. I think yeah. that Lou... It died after I had finished what I was doing. I think I'm not sure now. Yeah, you know, but um, I know that yeah. Lou was my champion. Yeah, at CC. You know, people there felt you know my stories were too strange. They were not accessible enough to the ordinary reader, and you know, and, and they said we should get rid of Rachel Pollock, and um, and Lou said no, no. You know, he, he said I think he told me once he said to them flat out. He said you know. If we're not publishing Rachel Pollock, what are we here for? Mm, yeah. if someone is really committed to the stories that she's doing, rather yeah. than whatever the market is looking for at the moment. And then he left. And then um, again, my mind—I can't remember the name—is is this an editor who became chief editor in chief at Marvel? Axel Alonso, yeah. Axel, yeah. Axel Alonso. You know, he was a great guy, a really good editor, but you know, he wanted to do stuff that wasn't what I was doing. Yeah, no, of yeah. course. An amicable party, you know, it was just we, you know, stopped doing stuff that I stopped doing stuff at Vertigo. And yeah. I, I guess, I guess New Gods was after that. I think. Yes. Uh, yeah. Tom yeah. It was after that, which is great. You know? Yeah. No, but um, it, it ended. And then Doom Patrol was one of the first, I think it was one of the first uh, teams that they moved back to the main DC line. Yeah. Cause I think John Acruti did it first after you. I think there was like a little gap. Yeah, yeah, there's been a year, year and a half, I think. Yeah, yeah and then they reintegrated it outside yeah. of Vertigo to just kind of be a, no offense to John Acruti, but a, a very dull team book. Um, <laughs> yeah. you, you know, where oh. they killed uh, uh, Dorothy. Uh, oh, they killed uh, Coagula or Kate Godwin yeah. off panel. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. Issue nine. Yeah. 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 Um, it, yeah. it was a very at that point it was it was a uh, you know somewhere to fit into not the not the Justice League of the Titans or Suicide Squad but just kind of all this just this this yeah. mush of, of team yeah. book yeah. at that yeah. point yeah I'm sure and I mean the sales reflected that it didn't uh, it didn't catch because it yeah. you know you, you wiped out all the originality from it and then you know and yeah it, it sounds way more harsh than I mean it but no but um but that's <laughs> like and, and that's not necessarily the creator's fault either that could have been editorial direction that could have yeah. been like let's yeah. let's make doom patrol more mainstream uh which yeah. is a bad idea yeah. but you could think it never was you know it was not mainstream originally mm-hmm. right. fair, of course it didn't sell originally either yeah right. you know, right. it was basically it, it came up the exact same time as the x-men if I recall about yeah, 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 yeah both featured a team head in a wheelchair Mm-hmm. Strange, you know, I don't know if one influenced the other one at all. I have no idea about that. Well, I don't think but, it's a big you know, thing. became super popular, and Doom Patrol kind of vanished. Yeah, yeah, it's um, it, it's weird how that happened. But um, also, uh, there's a TV show. Yeah, now uh, yeah, yeah. You know, so far it hasn't uh, mined anything in your run yet. But they, we don't know what season three has in store, and yeah, they, well, but, you know, they're doing Grant Morrison, so that they, they're really. Yeah. Well, they are, but the season three notes, um, it, it, there's some casting that's going on that's clearly from your run, I think. Okay. <laughs> what they're doing in the in the casting notes. They're, they're, there's characters that, that clearly look like they're coming from your run. So I'm excited yeah. to see that. Yeah. yeah. You know, I, I have this ridiculous technical problem. I won't bore your listeners, but I can't seem to get the um, TV show. Yeah. So I have to find have someone help me to do that because I, I need to see it, you know. Obviously. Well, you have you know five thousand streaming services, and so 
<laughs> you know, that's that's probably well, that, the thing is like I subscribe to it on my computer and uh, I can't work out how to get it from my computer to my television where I want to watch it. I don't want to watch it on my computer. Yeah. I just no, like I, watching TV shows on my computer or movies. I don't, I don't blame you there. No, no, not certainly not an unusual problem. I anyway, I'll figure it out. I'll have, I'll have somebody else figure it out, of course. So just Yeah, no, course. and um yeah. So maybe before season three premieres are around it, they'll finally collect your run because um, so far it, it, in omnibus format, they've put out the silver age run, uh-huh. uh, Paul Kupperberg's run before grants grants run. And then they skipped your run and put out John Burns run. Yeah. Yeah. And there oh, are, those yeah. are all big stars, you know, no, for, for sure. But um, y- you know, and again, no offense to John Byrne. We, suck up enough to john byrne as a <laughs> as a as someone who's contributed yeah, to yeah. comics but yes his run is the least like the show mm. i mean this is mostly okay. using the silver age a little bit of paul's and then a lot of grant stuff that, that was my impression of the two of the episodes i did, I did actually watch yeah um, yeah because yeah. um you know obviously you know doing um rita far would be from the silver age yeah. and um there, there was an episode, at least one, that um, was like a tribute to Paul Kupperberg's mm-hmm. uh, run. Yeah. But, um, you know, they, they teased putting out a trade of your stuff, and then they canceled it last minute. Mm. Um, you well, know, the other... That the sex men they was going to be... I thought that was me. I think that was Grant, actually. Yeah, the sex men were Grant. Yeah. It was Grant's parody of the X-Men. Yeah. 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 But, um... So what, but, yeah. what were they going to have for, for my run? Do you remember what, who it was, or... What storyline they were going to do? There, there's two. I'll, I'll I'll look while we're talking here. But the, in in some of the casting, um, some of the characters, there, there's a few. There's a few. So I'll I'll get it while we're talking yeah. here. Okay. Yeah. 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 But it's um. But yeah. So it hasn't. I mean, it hasn't happened. I guess they're filming season three. If they even yeah. started season, I think there's script writing still. I don't think it's gone into to film yeah. production but it's or i you know it who knows in the post-covid world who knows yeah, exactly. Everything is really yeah. yeah you know but um but yeah so you never know so if they haven't started filming yet it's not too late to uh reach out to rachel if you're working on the production there anyone <laughs> listening to have uh rachel maybe voice a robot or something like that <laughs> that would be great yeah yeah you know. like kate and i can voice kate that would be a lot of fun Oh yeah, no. Um, yeah, any anything like that, or you know, it's. Um, uh, I don't think I'm. I don't wouldn't. I have no acting experience for that, but on the other yeah. hand, it'd, it'd be fun to do it. Just you know, the a little bit part. And, no, oh, for sure. Do, doing much doing some writing, you know. You know, I, I told uh, what was it? Well, we talked when we talked to Richard. We kind of said the same thing. Like, can't they get you to just be like a security guard or something, and just be like they went that way. Like, yeah, yeah, just, <laughs> yeah, you know, any, anything like that. Yeah, sure. But, um, but yeah, I, I mean, it's uh, really uh, not only for fans, but to you personally is uh, one of the things you're most proud of in comics that, yeah, that you've done. Yeah, yeah. And um, and you know, you're you're still here. You'd appreciate having uh, your work in print. It's because it's the fact that it's so hard because people really just have to go and get back issues or get it digitally. The fact that people are willing to go digging and trying to find your run and still yeah. reach out to you to this day. Oh yeah, definitely. All the, you know, 25 years later to email you and say, this, this had a profound effect or uh, yeah. I, I became such a huge fan that speaks volumes. And yes. I, I think there uh, obviously would be uh, a market for, you know, especially something like an omnibus, which is a more pristine, you know, it's like an oversized, they tend to have smaller print runs anyway, mm. you know, like that, that there's, there's a market for, for people who would want that. There's also a completist market, people who are looking at their bookshelf and being like, ah, I got all the other stuff and, you know, yeah. there's that hole, I got to fill it in. Yeah, that would be wonderful. I have a I have a tarot deck next to me, which I always do, and I cut the deck while we were talking. And the card is intended just for titles wealth, because so obviously this is going to work out. And we'll Perfect. Out the end. Yeah. No. I, so I, yeah, for what it's worth, while I was looking it up, uh, Charlie the doll looks like it's it's uh, that 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 oh, character. Okay. Um, and the uh, the wild girls uh, that were there. Mm, and okay. It does seem like they're casting uh, Kate. Um, 
Oh, great. Wow. Uh, it, it does seem like Kate's coming. And then I, what I was reminded of the, uh, the SRS, um, which, yeah. which was yes. in your run, that <laughs> did appear on, yep. that was in season two. Okay. That was the Yes. Yeah. yeah. So that's actually already, already come out and filmed. Uh, Section yeah. Endangered Spirits. Yes. Yes. That was, yeah. that was an issue. The SRS was the term back then for what's now called gender confirmation surgery. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. And then it was called sex reassignment surgery. So SRS, that was a little joke on yeah. those letters. But. <laughs> it, it, it feels like at least that's quite a bit. So, I mean, in a yeah, that would be eight good. to 12 episodes there, there it feels like season three is going to probably mine quite a bit of a run. I would, it sounds yeah. like. Oh, cool. Cool. Yeah. Maybe so that trade out. Right? Yeah. Know, for, they never told me a word about it. So, you know. yeah. Yeah. Well, that's, so, um, that's unfortunately very common. They yeah. To because they own, they, they own the property. So. Yeah. yeah, but you know, um, this no. is a, a good chance no. for um, yeah. you know anyone at DC listening that uh, you know Rachel would love to watch the episodes that uh, yes, yeah, have her characters in it, and uh, <laughs> yeah, it would and it would be nice for uh, a lot of collectors to have trades on the business and any physical collection of that run would would be deeply uh, appreciated, especially for someone like me uh, who would like to just pick up one or two volumes instead of having to go through my box and pull out the individual issues. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you have a, I mean, both in comics, but also kind of in your books, you have a, a large amount of customers and fans who really like your work. Yeah, um, I do. And, uh, and a lot of loyal fans. I mean, the, the thing that kind of strikes you is if you just kind of look online at some of your material, you have, you have people, you have very loyal customers, uh, who seem yeah. to really follow you from, from property to property. And, uh, I mean, you know, I have, um, I have 5,000 friends on Facebook. I could have a lot more if I didn't want to want to pay money to have the whole, you know, yeah. uh, official setup. But, you know, many other thousands of people follow what I do on Facebook. So it would reach people for sure, you know. And, and you're, I mean, you're still an active writer. So, I mean, if someone yeah. like from D.C. wanted to reach yeah. out and be like, hey, season three of Doom Patrol is coming out. Uh, we thought we'd do like a, a special comic uh, be smart. You, okay, you know? I would obviously love to. I'd love to do something like that. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it, it's uh, we did we talked. I mean, while well, we we talk comics, and that's the majority of people here. But I mean, um, just you know, I, I I mentioned right before we we started recording um, that I was looking into some of your nonfiction work that you're doing, and and there's just I think you made the the comment that uh, somebody said I've read all your your work, and <laughs> your your response is probably not. Is that yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I would like to. I always fantasize saying, "No, you haven't." Yes. Of course, that's very rude. So I just say, "I said probably not something like that." Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it's there's a lot of material out there, and it's it's yeah. it's very powerful. I think the the theme uh, for me always with your work was that you, uh, which we said earlier, uh, you you earn your moments. It's it's not yeah. nothing seems casual. Nothing seems like it's. Uh, you know, hey, I, I felt like I wanted to write about trans characters, so in this panel, here you go, and we're done. <laughs> it's it's. Yeah. Uh, you know, you, you you help the the customer and the reader come to understand yeah, yeah. what they're reading. I, I, really I think you know. Yeah. I think that was part of what Lou kind of really schooled me on. Yeah, because you know, I was doing these things, these sort of sensationalist, surreal villains and stuff. The stuff I liked in in, in um, Grant so much, you know. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, Lou said, "Look, you know, you have to bring the readers along. They have to know what you're getting at. I to know what these things are about." And that actually made the stories much stronger. I thought. Oh, absolutely. You, you have, uh, I want to make sure we do, you do have some things coming up. You have some, some books or some items you're working on. Yeah. I always work on a bunch of things. So, um, I'm, so recently I just had an audio version of my original tower book, 70 degrees of wisdom, which is the thing I'm most famous for mm -hmm. around yeah. the world. Yeah. And so that's available as an audio book. I've been listening to it. The woman reading it's terrific. So that's really nice. Yeah. I'm doing a, um, new edition of a book called the forest of souls which came out i guess like 20 years ago mm -hmm. and it was always my favorite book about tarot stuff and it's not a card by card thing it's more exploring the outer reaches of tarot i'm oh, very yeah. happy about that i'm finishing a novella it doesn't have a publisher yet because i want to have it finished before i sent it out um about a um a 13 or 14 year old girl who gets a magic fountain pen in the mail one day and discovers that this fountain pen is very powerful and very dangerous magical object. Mm -hmm. And so it's all about her coming to terms with herself and with her family and the idea of power. And that's been a very exciting thing to work with. So I'm looking forward to that very much. Nice. That's called yeah. Ordo Lumina Furiosa. 
because the pen has letters on O L F. It's an actual pen. Nice. Uh, time. Yeah, and and a lot of publishers now. Um, you, you've seen a, a big jump in. Uh, you know, especially at like Marvel and DC, they're looking for writers who are known well beyond comics. They're looking at like, you know, novelists and TV writers and stuff like that. And uh, you're, you're, you're a, a world renowned and have worldwide recognition for your tarot work. Yeah. And, and you're an Arthur C. Clarke award winning novelist. Yeah. Multiple awards. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so just, just to remind people, if anyone's listening, Yes, you, you know, um, you, you're you're an incredibly accomplished person. You're you're, you're all you have also been an activist. Um, yeah, mm -hmm, I, I mean, you've you've done a, a great deal, and you are you're exactly the kind of person they seem to seek out to mm -hmm. work for them now. And none of your stuff's in print. <laughs> there, was <one> story, <laughs> there was one storyline I really wanted to do in Doom Patrol. I never got to do it. Mm -hmm. But it was a good thing to do, either bringing, I guess I could bring back Doom Patrol because other people are doing it. Sure. But also it was some other way. And it was basically a tarot themed superhero story. Mm -hmm. And the idea would be um, it, it would begin with um, this, this homeless guy, this tramp. You know, mm -hmm. and maybe he's a full card, you know, this miserable homeless person, right? Yeah, sure. We find it's called ATM. So ATM stands for automatic tarot machine. Right. <laughs> and so he finds an ATM bank card and he puts it into uh, the slot and it says, um, this left side, it says automatic tarot machine, welcome zero zero the fool. Mm -hmm. And then so type in your, um, your key card, your numbers, you know, mm -hmm. type in zero 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 one. That's He's transformed to the magician. So nice. Anytime okay. he needs to do something, he transfers the next next number of the tarot cards. Mm -hmm. And um, and my idea of Doom Patrol is going to get to Daphne kills them all. Yeah. <laughs> but there's some some will survive somehow, and still continues to hold it, hold it down. And at the end, they get to card twenty, which is the resurrection card, and that, that brings everyone comes back to life. And then at the end, um, cool. it was Dorothy steals the card. And puts it mm -hmm. back in and types zero 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 again and he's mm -hmm. reduced back to being the homeless fool. Yes. Nice. And that's how they I say like that. So that, would, yeah. that, would be, that would reach my biggest audience in the world. No. That, that all would be great. But yeah, I, I mean it, it would that's be nice if, if your stuff could be in print so people could see it. It would be nice if uh, <laughs> a lot of other creators like uh, you know Maddie Blostein's uh, Death Wish has never been reprinted um, oh, from Milestone. Uh, mm -hmm. Nearly all of Caitlin R. Kiernan's uh, The Dreaming, uh, yeah. she did a, a handful of issues are in a trade, but she wrote it for years, and wow. nearly that's all of it's not that's in print. That's incredible. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah I, 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 I thought that was a very famous run. Maybe I'm wrong. It, about it, that. it is, but it's, it uh, is. it's yeah. a real choice for being in print. It's, I'm it, 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 it's, yeah. uh, it is a famous run. It's a well-received run. It's just a yeah. very strange choice uh, that you know, Joe and I have talked about many times before of, of the very odd choices people make of what they reprint. And it, yeah. and I think coming to a conclusion, it's, it's not a choice. It's just forgetting what you you should do, but but yeah, <laughs> well yeah, I'm, I'm sure that DC is very different from when I worked there. Oh, for sure. There's not much. It has to be more corporate because now they're in, in you know, television and movies. AT and T, yeah, that, yeah. That, that changes everything, you know. Yeah, but, so but they yeah, have, they have NBA is deciding everything. <laughs> yeah, which um, is all the more reason if they're going to use your your characters on a, a TV show to uh, have your stuff in print, uh, yeah, even if it's. Absolutely. <laughs> Just for money to We're make. hurting Joe's soul at this point, I think. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah, <laughs> well, no, it's, it's something yeah, we talked about. Hopefully they're going to do that. I mean, hopefully now that if they go, maybe they haven't decided finally, but if they really go ahead and do that, then they, they probably will because it would make sense. It would be kind of crazy not to, wouldn't it? Yeah, so it, it would also be nice it. for um, Richard to have the rest of Absolutely. his yeah. drawn issues. It would be nice for Linda Medley and Ted McKeever. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. uh, you, you know, uh, uh, it would be uh, it would be great for Ted. Uh, a lot of Ted's... Uh, Ted was... That's a whole other conversation. If Ted McKeever was very popular in the mid-90s and yeah. DC has reprinted very little of Ted's work. Yeah. <laughs> I guess because it was kind of strange. 
I, I and guess, it's but kind of radical, and so now they want everything to be very mainstream and safe. I suppose. It's, it's, I guess, but he was he was uh, you know revolutionary and has a lot of big fans, or, or did sure. you know? And then yeah. it's strange. Well, I mean, I don't, I don't know. I'm not obviously not part of any decisions by DC. Of course, sure, sure of course. But, you know, what strikes me is that like sometimes you read how like a a company that's going very mainstream, mm-hmm. they have like a an overall concept, right? And mm-hmm. it's something they, it's something they know is popular, no one makes money, but it's outside that concept. Mm-hmm. They mm-hmm. decide they can't use it because they have to stay always focused on the main overlying thing, overlying theme they're selling for the company. So I could see that being yeah. the case. I mean, I wouldn't yeah. agree with it. Yeah. I would never run a company like that, but I could see how that might be in a corporate decision. Oh, of yeah, course. It's, it's not it's following, but it's not yeah. part of what we're doing. You know, for, it's, it's, for, it's yeah. absolutely a machine at this point. And, um, yeah. and I, I think in many cases, it's more opportunistic than thought through. But uh, yeah, and also to make it very clear so no one misinterprets this, none of us are implying that there are just people like, you know, like wringing their hands being like, we'll never let Rachel Pollock squirt. <laughs> <laughs> like, like, it's not, it's, it, you know, if it, that'd, like, be, that'd be more fun if it was a case, but no, it no, would be no, more no. fun. But yeah. it's honestly a lot of people who probably, you know, started working, even. Even if they started working there 20 years ago, just aren't aware of the run. Well, I mean, maybe to Joe's point and, and Rachel, I, I, again, this is awesome. Just, just getting a chance to talk to you. I think in many cases, stuff like this reminds people that it's there and they, yeah. they, they put it out. It's, it has happened a few times that, yeah. uh, you know, it's it. And, and so maybe these can lead to things, but I, but I Joe briefly touched on it. I mean, you, you've won very significant awards for your science fiction work, for your novels and, and, uh, Definitely, um, if you haven't had a chance to check out uh, Rachel's books, I would I would strongly recommend you do so. They're they got a lot. Yeah, I mean, there's there's magic, there's science, there's uh, fantasy elements, there's you know, touches on different religions, and I, I mean, it's just they're very yeah. very deep work. And, Thank you. Yeah, no, it, it's great stuff, and there's also a lot of um, you know, like we were touching on before. There, are, you, you know, um, there are, you know trans creators that are getting work now like Lila Sturgis, Max Asagio, Crystal Frazier, Tamara Bonvillain, uh, Sophie Campbell, um, you know, Sophie Campbell recently doing a, a bunch of stuff with the uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, but she had previously done uh, some Vertigo stuff. I think she drew issues of House of Mystery. Hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. That, yeah. yeah. You know, you mentioned before my novel Unquenchable Fire, which won the Office of yeah. the Award. Yeah. Well, yeah. Actually, right now, there's a brilliant comics writer Who's adapting it to a comic online? Yeah, you know, the writer's name Joe Corallo, and what mm-hmm. I've seen so far is really wonderful and amazing. So yeah, so we're I'm excited uh, about that. Yeah, we're we're working on stuff like that, and then uh, you know, Rachel and I have something else that we can't go into yet, but hopefully, we'll have uh, more information on that soon. Um, Which is very relevant to things we're talking about, actually. Yeah. 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 No, a- absolutely. But um, but yeah, it, it's been exciting. It, it's been uh, great, you know, getting to, you know, I was also one of those fans who reached out to Rachel who after reading Doom Patrol, ah. and like, <laughs> this was great. Uh, you know, it was from Martha Thomas's because um, mm. I, I had talked to like one day I, I was just talking to Martha. I was just like, you know, this is years ago now, but I was just like, you know, everyone talks about Grant Strom, but no one, you know, I, I, there's no collection of like, you know, I, I was talking about that and, sh- and Martha was like, no, it's good. You should read it. Mm-hmm. A- and I went and I read it and I'm like, this is uh, amazing. Like, <laughs> why, yeah, yeah. why aren't we you know, talking about that? Yeah. 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 Uh, well, Rachel, I, I just want to say thank you. I, I, you, you gave us a, a, you know, 90 minutes of your time and, yeah. uh, and what a great time. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, well, well, I'd love to chat with you again soon sometime. Talk about some of your novels, your nonfiction, your yeah. peril work. Um, so I need to do it anytime. Yeah, we, sh- we should yeah. definitely come back and do it again. But it, it's uh, it's amazing. Uh, it, you know, check out those comics if you haven't seen them before. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and Rachel, thank you again. And, and we hope to talk to you very soon. Okay. Yeah, that would be great. And uh, I hope we get next time we talk to you, it's because they announced that they're finally reprinting your work. So. Yes. Yeah. That, that would be great. Yes, okay. <laughs> that would be. Deal. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Perch. Yeah. Thanks, Joe. Thank you.